see our willing heart attitudes, attitudes of gratitude as we give, as we bring our offerings to you, that is worshipfully and devotionally, for we know that you love cheerful givers. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Search our love this life and never understand why the storms and all the strife seem unguarded by God's hand. Raise your
All right, let's all stand once again as we stand together and sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's sing that song together. <clears throat> oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that charms our fears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As we sing this next verse, kids go on and go down to children's discipleship and have any kids go into nursery. Now is the time to take them down as we sing this next verse. He breaks the power of cancel sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He breaks the power of cancel sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. And you may be seated. Happy Lord's Day. This morning we continue our normal course of study of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ according to the Gospel of Luke. Please turn to Luke 22. And we're going to be 
expounding on the verses 35 through 38. If you're using the Pew Bible, it is page 88. That is the second page 88 in the New Testament section of our Pew Bible. Let me briefly set up the scene here for you. Jesus and his apostles are still in the upper room, the place where they celebrate the Passover meal, and also the place where Jesus institutes a brand new meal celebration. We now refer to today as the Lord's Supper. Judas Iscariot has just slipped away to betray Jesus to the religious elites who want to arrest Jesus in secret, not wanting to cause any riot if they did it in public. And so you can see that Jesus is in great, great danger. But as fully in control of the situation as Jesus is, he compassionately and lovingly and patiently gives advice to Simon Peter as well as to the other ten apostles. You know that Jesus predicts Simon Peter's denial. But then he also encourages Peter to help his fellow apostles after that he is restored and now, in part two of this lesson, Jesus gives another set of advices related to the spread of the good news. And let's pick it up now in verses 35 through 38. Church, are you there? Say amen. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lack ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end or fulfillment. Verse 38, And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, All right, that's enough. It is enough. End quote. Thus far is the reading of God's word. May it be a blessing in your hearing this morning. I want to give to you Two major advices here from Jesus from this text. Number one, the conditions for proclaiming the good news have changed. We find that in verses 35 through 37. And so therefore, Jesus advises them differently this time. Have you ever heard of the saying, uh, desperate times calls for desperate measures. Have you ever heard that? All right, many of you have heard that. Um, that is uh, attributed to Hippocrates, the famous Greek physician. Desperate times call for desperate measures. For example, a desperate measure of uh, amputating a leg in order to save the life of that person. That's what that quotation comes from, and that's what it is all about. Here in our text, we're told that Jesus advises the, the apostles that they are in desperate times. They are in danger. Jesus is in danger. The apostles are in danger. Jesus knows it is only a matter of several hours later that he is crucified. And Jesus doesn't want his good news, 
the good news of the kingdom of God, it is here, it is near. Therefore, repent and be baptized and believe in the Messiah. He doesn't want that good news to be snuffed out. It must be proclaimed by his apostles. That's the context here of why Jesus is giving them this advice. I want you to, I want you to look at uh, Luke 9. Uh, just a few pages there from where you're at. Luke 9, 1 through 6. The previous preaching tours that Jesus told his apostles to go and do, he said to them not to bring any provisions, not a lunch box, not an extra pair of sandals, not an extra pair of cloak for the cold at night, not a sword or any weapon. Jesus came from heaven, right? To seek and to save that which was lost. And now in Luke 9, as well as in other texts, he deployed his deputies, per se, to proclaim this good news that Jesus had come to seek and to save that which was lost. Here in Luke 9, they were in a relatively good territory. They're in the northern region of Israel, in the parts of Galilee. The people were hospitable to them. The Galileans pretty much welcomed them. And in the region of Galilee, there were even Gentiles that welcomed them. The common folks were friendly to the news of this itinerant rabbi Jesus. Let's look at verses 1 through 6. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece, and whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide, and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when ye go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing Everywhere. I want you to jump down to chapter 10. Just a page over. In verses 1 through 8, I read, After these things the Lord appointed other 70 also. If you have a modern translation, I think that's 72. And sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes and salute no man by the way. Don't socialize even on the street because there is an urgency of spreading the good news. Verse 5, And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, Eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you, but into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and so on and so forth. We notice here in these texts that we just read a few a couple of things. First, there was a great urgency, a sense of urgency to the mission. They had to do the mission really quick. 
Don't even spend time socializing on the streets. Proclaim the good news. God's kingdom is near. Repent of your sins and believe in the Messiah. There was a sense of urgency to the mission. We also see there was a sense of trusting the sovereign provision of God for their regular, basic, daily needs, such as food and clothing and sleep. The Lord taught them a very valuable lesson here. The Lord provides for their needs. Amen? They had to completely rely on the supply of the Lord. And this is reminiscent of what the Apostle Paul wrote later. You remember in Philippians 4.19, the Apostle Paul tells the Philippians, But my God shall supply all your need according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, the apostles of Christ learned a very valuable lesson here. And it is the same for us today that in the work of the ministry, particularly in the preaching of repentance and faith, for the kingdom of God is at hand, the Lord provides for His faithful servants. By the way, let me ask you this question. Not a trick question. What or who did God use as instruments to provide for the basic needs of His preachers? The people. The people. The people of God. Uh, Luke 10 says this, that whenever you enter a house, first say, may peace be on this house. The households, the members of those households, they recognized the peace of God. May peace be on this house. And if a peace-loving person is there, your peace will remain on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that same house, eating and drinking what they give you, even if it's sushi, you still eat it, right? For the worker deserves his pay, all right? So that principle back then is pretty much the same principle with which our ministry today operates. God uses the instrumentality of his own people, the people who love the peace of God, the people who have the peace of God upon in their hearts, spread abroad in their hearts, Romans chapter 5. Those are the people who have been justified, meaning they are the people who are saved. God uses the people of God to provide for the faithful ministering of his gospel. God uses the instrumentality of his people to provide for his faithful ministers. And the apostles of Christ learned a very valuable lesson then. They had to trust in the sovereign provision of God for their regular and basic needs. But as my first point this morning goes, the conditions for proclaiming the good news have now changed. The mission remains the same. Amen? The message remains the same. Amen? But the conditions, according to Jesus Christ now, in this text, the conditions in the society have changed. One author said, this is not a reversal of normal rules for the church's mission, but an exception in a time of crisis. In verse 36, Jesus says, But now he who has a purse, that's a money bag, let him take it, and likewise his scrip, or a knapsack, a bag that is usually 
uh, strapped on your back like a backpack which carries food supplies or extra clothing. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. If I was there, I would have asked the question, why Lord? And I think uh, it is not impossible to uh, determine that they did ask the question. And so the answer is simply because the conditions for proclaiming the good news now have changed. People are not going to be as hospitable as before. In fact, some of them are going to be hostile to you. So, you need to provide for yourself. You need to protect yourself. And so that my message, the Lord Jesus would say, my good news will continue to be proclaimed. I do not want my message to be snuffed out. That's the inference here in these verses. On verse 36, A.T. Robertson, expert on the biblical Greek language here, writes, quote, Buy a sword, and he says, This is for defense, clearly. And then he adds, Jesus does not mean that his disciples are to repel force by force but that they are to be ready to defend Jesus' cause against attack. Changed conditions bring changed needs. This language can be misunderstood as it was then, end quote. Let me ask you some questions here as we're interacting with the text of Scripture this morning. What does Jesus mean when he says, he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Does he mean for the apostles now to use the sword to threaten people to provide for their food and lodging? No. Does Jesus mean for them to use the sword to persuade people to believe in their message? No. Does Jesus mean for the apostles to use the sword to defend their Lord and Master, Jesus Christ? No. You'll find that out later. No. To repel or resist the arrest of their Master? No. Does He mean for the apostles to defend themselves from assaults later on? And I think the answer to that is yes. One key to, un to understanding this is the context with, with which Jesus gives uh, them these advices. And what is the context then with which Jesus gives them these instructions? Well, we already read the, uh, Luke 9 and 10, that's the context that Jesus was talking about. We already uh, went over that uh, uh, earlier. That was before, but now it will be different. Things have changed. Conditions have changed. Desperate times demand desperate measures. Before, as one commentator said, they learned the great lesson of absolute trust in their sender. Jesus did provide for them through the name and the fame with which Jesus had filled all Galilee. Never once had Jesus failed them. But now, when Jesus sends out his apostles into all the world after his resurrection, the situation will be completely changed. Jesus, their sender, will indeed still take care of them, but not in the former way. And so Jesus tells the apostles to buy a Roman short sword, if necessary, even at the price of their outer robe. It is better to freeze at night than to be killed. In quote. Later on, we see an example of this in the life of the Apostle Paul, I want us to look at 2 Corinthians 11, 26 
and 27. I don't think we have a lot of records of Peter and the other apostles being maligned, persecuted, castigated, and so on. But we do have records of Peter and John being imprisoned, right? Beaten up. James beheaded, right? Deacon Stephen stoned to death. Right? In fact, tradition tells us that all of the apostles died a martyr's death, except for John, who miraculously survived a cauldron of boiling oil. Acts chapter 12 tells us that Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now, in 2 Corinthians, we're given a personal testimony of the Apostle Paul himself, how he went through so many so much dangers. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. In journeyings often, in perils, that's dangers of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, the hatred of the Jews against him. In perils by the heathen, the Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness. In watchings often. In hunger and thirst. In fastings often. In cold and nakedness. I don't think it would have been wrong if the apostles defended themselves. I don't think it would have been wrong if they did in fact use the short sword at least to deter their hostile enemy. But why did they not use it why did the apostle paul not retaliate with the sword peter and john i've mentioned who were imprisoned did they use the short sword to defend themselves no neither did james nor stephen and there's a simple answer and it is this Jesus preferred that they did not use it. Remember, when Peter wields it against one of the temple guards, ends up slicing off the guard's ear. Remember that. What does Christ do? He tells Peter to put away the sword, right? Because all who take the sword will die by the sword. You think that I can't appeal to my father, Jesus said, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? And so by telling them back to the upper room where Jesus gave them advice, he, hath, he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Jesus only meant essentially to have a short sword, listen carefully, because everybody on the street wears one. It was sort of like that was part of their regular outfit in ancient Israel. The vast majority of them, the men, wore a short sword or a knife of some sort. 
Have you ever been to Arizona or Texas where they have open carry? I was blown away when I was traveling through uh, Arizona to Tucson and seeing these guys go into the grocery store with their open carry arms. In that sense, that same sense, Jesus was telling them, go get you a sword. And essentially because that, that's what the regular uh, outfit of, the, of most of the men were on the street in ancient Israel. And not necessarily that they should retaliate using the sword. The point that Jesus makes is simply that before I told you not to bring any basic needs. God will provide all your basic needs for you. Now, provide for yourself the regular basic needs to include a short sword because that was part of the traveling man during that time in Israel. But we see here in our text as well, unfortunately, the apostles take Jesus' word literally. Whereas, I believe Jesus is simply making a point that before you didn't have to worry about daily provisions, but now you go ahead and provide for your own to include a short sword, which was part of the outfit that many men wore in that day. And that's why you see a language here. Look at our text, Luke 22. Luke 22. Look at verse 38. Verse 38, after that Jesus <laughs> tells them about the Scripture and how the Scripture must be fulfilled concerning His death, burial, and resurrection, verse 38 says, And they, that's the apostles, said, Lord, look, here are two swords. It was probably the swords that they found in that upper room where they were cutting up the meat for their dinner. And that's why verse 38 ends up very abruptly with these words. And he said unto them, all right, folks, that's enough. It is enough. He's not talking about that the two swords are enough. He's telling them, you guys are dense. You're not understanding what I'm saying. Enough. Let's no more talk about swords. That's what he was saying here. And so, which brings us to the second point this morning, and that is the scriptures are fulfilled in verse 37. First major advice for them. The conditions have changed. You have to provide for yourself now. But don't worry. I will be with you. you later on, you, you find in Matthew 28 that he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel, make disciples. Right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. You're going to have to provide for yourself, but I'll be with you. And there's a sense in which Philippians 4.19 still works, but my God shall supply our, your needs according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus is with us as we go out into the world and preach the gospel. And so that was the first advice he gives them. The second one is simply this, that the scriptures are fulfilled in what I'm about to do here in just several hours. This quotation here is from Isaiah 53, 12. Go there uh, just real quick. As you're going there to Isaiah 53, 12, one Bible commentator said this, the phrase... He was numbered with transgressors does not primarily refer to Christ being crucified 
with two criminals. It does not primarily refer to Christ associating with sinners during his earthly ministry. That he walked and talked with the prostitutes and the thieves. It refers specifically to Christ's death. Listen, in the place of sinners, he was numbered with transgressors. His death in the place of sinners. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah teaches that God categorized Jesus, meaning God the Father treated Jesus as a transgressor. And then punished him as a substitute for sinners. That thought is repeated in different forms 20 times in Isaiah 53 alone. And thus, this statement quoted by the Lord in Luke 22 summarizes the entire chapter of Isaiah 53. Church, are you there? Say amen. Therefore... Will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong? That's a war language. After that the general or the commander defeats an army, defeats uh, the enemy armies, he is given the spoil of the war. Okay? This is talking about Jesus receiving the spoil of the war in the 1,000-year reign of Christ. All right? Now let's continue reading. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus is completely committed to the Scripture. Okay, look back in Luke 22, verse 35 through 38. He said a couple of times about the Scriptures that it's going to be fulfilled, and it's going to be fulfilled in Him. So I say to you that He is completely committed to the scriptures that's why you and i should also be completely committed to the scriptures this is a great application for us think about this jesus would die in just about several hours he knew his apostles would deny him and they would all run away from him but he loved them. He remained ever so compassionate to them. He remained so ever patient with them. And that's why he was giving them all these advices. Moreover, one of the most compelling reasons why he must go through this death was so that the scriptures are fulfilled. You see how biblically committed Jesus Christ is? This is one of the reasons why you and I should be biblical people. I hope that you can see that. Now, last verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21, because I want you to see how the Apostle Paul understood this phrase being numbered with transgressors. The prophecy that Isaiah wrote of the Lord Jesus Christ some 700 years prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ the Apostle Paul understood this being numbered with transgressors prophecy 
And he means that Jesus identifies with sinners. And God the Father categorizes or treats Jesus as a sinner, as a transgressor. All the while, Jesus is perfect, right? Sinless, holy, perfectly righteous. And yet, Jesus died in the place of you and me. Look at verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, that is God, has made him, that is Christ, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh, this is beautiful. Listen carefully. God treated Jesus Christ as if he lived your life. And then God treats you and me as if we had lived Jesus' perfect life. Beautiful. What a beautiful Savior we have in Jesus. Applications for this morning. The fact that Jesus believed in the Old Testament Scriptures should compel and encourage us to believe what He left us in the New Testament. Christian, believe the Scriptures. Jesus is completely committed to it. There is no reason why you or I should doubt its trustworthiness. Go to work tomorrow and tell your co-workers, Hey, did you know that Jesus was completely biblical? Look, he was committed to fulfilling what was written in Isaiah 53 about him. Did you know that? Secondly, the apostles answer by pointing to the two swords they had with them, is that what impressed them chiefly? One writer said that was pitiful. They failed to grasp even the fact that Jesus spoke about their future needs and travels and thought only of the present. So let me ask you this question. As an application from what we read this morning, what are you most impressed about? Weapons? Retaliation? The two short swords? Revenge? I believe we should be most impressed instead with the message of the gospel. That Christ died for sinners. He was buried and he rose again. I believe we should be most impressed about how we need to convey this wonderful good news to others. Yes, there is hostility against Christianity. But do not stop proclaiming the truth. Yes, there are people who hate our guts. But don't stop speaking the truth in love. Yes, there are people who hate and are wanting to snuff us out. Wanting to take us out. Wanting to shut us up. And wanting to snuff out. Jesus, from all areas of the public arena. But do not let this discourage you. 
speak the truth in love. Continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I must continue to make his message known. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior and Lord, our big brother, who is compassionate to us, patient with us, Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. You believe the Bible. Help us to follow your example, to be completely committed to the Scriptures. Make us to realize that our chief concern should not be about revenge or weapons to defend ourselves, but our chief concern should be to make the message of the gospel known to every man, woman, boy, or girl who come our way. What a great Savior you are, Jesus. And so we pray this in your most holy name. And God's people said, Amen and Amen. Let's all stand together. If you have any questions, you wanted clarifications of what you heard here this morning, please don't hesitate to ask a question. I encourage you to sit down with me and we'll look for our right answers together. If you believe that the Holy Spirit is working in your conscience, tugging you to repent and believe the gospel, I encourage you, do not neglect such great salvation. Come to God. Ask for mercy. He shows mercy to whomever he wants to show mercy. Jesus Christ even said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Why? Because I will give you rest. That's Christ's invitation. And that is the preacher's invitation this morning to all of you as well. If you say, Pastor Christian, I am repentant of my sins and I am believing in Christ. I am understanding that He... Christ went through all that he went through for me. I understand that now. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again for me. I believe he ascended into heaven and he is interceding for me. I believe this already. If that is you, then I encourage you to make that kind of profession public by waters Baptism, believer's baptism. And so, that is my pleading with you this morning. Don't forget tonight, 6 p.m., systematic theology session, the doctrine of the holiness of God. I hope you'll come. And then, Miss Hannah Bennett. Miss Hannah Bennett, can we ask her to come up here and, and uh, stand by her uh, table back there? Thank you. Uh, greet her. Uh, greet her, that is. Not greet, greet her, but greet her. <laughs> uh, welcome her. And um, if you have a gift for her, meet her there uh, by her table. All right? Brother Steve, won't you come dismiss us in a word of prayer? Please receive the benediction. The Lord Jesus Christ believes in the Scripture this is reason enough that you and I should as well. The will of the Father be done in you and the Holy Spirit instill and remind you of this precious truth which you heard this morning. This is your blessing. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, what a mighty and wonderful and gracious God that we have through you. We thank you, Lord, for the, the love that you have given to us by sending your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, to become um, sin for us and that we may know your righteousness. And Father, we pray that we may be that witness as we go out and touch the hearts and lives of people that are around us, that we may share you with them, Lord, and give us the encouragement in our hearts to do so. 
Take us away, Lord, that today and let us remember the words that we have been and we heard from the word of God today, Father. And Father, we may we be back this evening and with our hearts and minds open to receive once again. We thank you, Lord, for your love you've given to us, for hearing our prayers and answering our prayers, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You're dismissed.